So Ivan, just let's show in terms how this translates into ter in terms of ir irregularities, behavior, and effect on GNSS. We are going to concentrate on GNSS for this for this talk. So first of all, we will. I like to um, uh, take what Tobias told you yesterday and extend a little bit, just to tell you that GNSS are excellent, pro provide an excellent pro probing of the ionosphere, actually can rely on several constellations, the global one are GPS, uh, GLONASS, the Russian one, the European one, Galileo, and the Beidou. And the good thing is that they cross entirely the ionosphere, providing um, probing with all the layers. Of course, we don't resolve the altitude, so typically what we deal with GNSS, we, we are able to reconstruct the GNSS is a kind of squeezing of the ionosphere on a layer. Usually it's 350 kilometers, but it varies a lot as the, the actual layer of the ionosphere. Uh, it's not a layer, of course. And most of all, it is the, um, the ionosphere is the most poses the most dramatic threats to GNSS, particularly in the error budget, is, it presents the largest one. So what we can, when we deal with GNSS, what we can actually measure, we can measure the phase and the code of the signal, which are, that have many terms inside. The I term is the ionospheric uh, term. And you see here all the various um, components of the error budget. So the presence of a smooth ionosphere introduced a delay of the modulation, so the code measurement will be larger than in vacuum, and advance of the carrier phase. So the carrier phase measurement will be smaller than in vacuum. But mostly you can get these two quantities to do a lot of things. Usually we use combination of GNSS measurements. This one is the ionosphere free linear combination. We deal just with multi-frequency because um, observation, so because GNSS satellites provide, emit several uh, frequencies, at least two or three, and by combining the, the frequency in, this, in the so-called ionosphere-free linear combination, this is, this, this is the frequency of the first uh, frequency, this is the phase of the first frequency, and then the relative uh, of the second one, it removes up to the 90.9% of the ionospheric effect, and uh, which depends on the inverse square of the frequency, and it's mostly used for positioning and to assess the higher order ionospheric effect, which are below the centimeter level in under quiet conditions. And usually we use also the geometry-free combination, which is actually just the difference between the phases of the two. It cancels the, the geometrical part of the measurement, and it's used for the estimation of the total electron content, which is one of the parameters you have seen in these days. So. It is defined that the integral of the, electron, of the plasma density along the ray path connecting the receiver to the satellite, that's the expression of the Slantec you can get from the uh, observers of the, of the GNSS, from the GNSS observable, there is this epsilon, which is actually not an epsilon, is the uh, uh, error contributing to the termination of, S, of the slant TC, which is actually also the career of many researchers, some of them are also <laughs> here, and it's usually measured. Uh, it's not a trivial problem. It's not the subject of this talk, but really, it will be. It is a big, it's a big trouble. Uh, probably only God, only God knows the real TC. So uh, T, it is expressed usually in TC unit. As mentioned, we can also map this slant TC into a vertical TC to get rid of the geometry, but we must put into the, uh, into, into the onto the table some assumptions. So for instance, that you have to put this information on a specific Pierce point, again, 350 kilometers, it's the standard assumption, and you can get so a vertical TC. And you can even use the, the TC to make a time derivative. I already introduced something like that yesterday to obtain the so-called rate of TC change, which is quite often used to investigate variation fluctuations of TC. This is, for instance, a day of observation from one receiver in Antarctica, and this is each color represents a satellite, so you may see that somehow the TC is a, very, is a largely varying 
quantity. So, bear this, uh, bear this in, in mind, and let's start talking to ionospheric scintillation. So the word scintillation, it's not something invented for the ionosphere. There are actually three big categories of scintillation. There is the interplanetary scintillation, the tropospheric scintillation, the ionospheric scintillation. Each of them has a cause, have a co has a cause. The interplanetary scintillation is due to inhomogeneities in the solar wind. The tropospheric one is due to the neutral turbulence and the ionospheric scintillation is due to ionospheric irregularities. And what they cause? They cause fluctuation in the intensity of radio stars, fluctuation of the optical ray path, but the twinkling of stars and the fluctuation of the amplitude and space of the signal recorded by GNSS satellites. So if we want to concentrate and understand the scintillation, we can use somehow the, the same, uh, the same of, uh, it's the same of the twinkling of stars. So we to need to understand the effect, we need to say something about the cause. So before speaking about scintillation, be patient, and let's start again with the ionospheric irregularities. So I just uh, stolen this slide from Ivan Talk. <laughs> it's yours, <laughs> you know. So what are irregularities? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they are anomalies. Uh, so positive or negative gradients with respect to the background, ideal, smooth, ambient ionosphere, which actually doesn't exist. Uh, is there a quiet ionosphere behaving in a quiet way? I don't know, probably not. So, but we need to think in terms of variations, gradients of, plus of density with respect, or oh, passage of gradients, gradients of density, spatial temporal gradients of density that have, as I mentioned yesterday, they vary on a large scale size ranges. So they go from the uh, centimeter level up to the 1,000 kilometer uh, scale. And remember that the scale is not an absolute scale. In this case, I will talk about irregularities from the GNSS perspective. So there are small scales for GNSS, medium scale for GNSS, and large scale for GNSS. Small scale irregularities are the problem for GNSS. I will, t I will show you before. They are usually due to the uh, instability process, in particular to the, the growth and decrease of the, of the instability process that lead to formation of small scale irregularity. There is kind of this magic, or magic sentence, few hundreds of meters, which is the order of magnitude of the small scale irregularities below the so-called Fresnel, Fresnel scale. I'm going to tell you more. And they are due mainly to Kelvin, Helmholtz, and gradient drift instability at high latitude. They are rare because the scales are rare. The formation of scale is rare because it's due to the forcing from the geospace. Why you learn that those embedded in the plasma bubble and created by the Rayleigh terror instabilities are very common. Hmm? Then there are the medium scale irregularities. They are usually formed at the boundaries of larger or large scale irregularities. You will see uh, um, scales ranging from uh, above the Fresnel scale, so above 300 of, of meters, above to a few uh, tens of kilometers in the auroral oval, in the polar cap, because of the patches, the auroral broad, the sour, menacing densities, and equatorial plasma bubbles. And they are a problem, not the problem, because they can be somehow treated. The, 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 the one in the high latitude are mostly storm time phenomena. The one that are plasma bubble are modulated, again, uh, from penetrating electric field, the disturbance time electric field, uh, and they are modulated by storm time phenomena due to the changes into the electrodynamics of the low latitude ionosphere. And then there is the large scale structure that are not a problem besides the ID, but I'm not going not to talk about that. <coughs> so, ionospheric irregularities are variation of the plasma density. So your signal is undergoes through refraction because it passes from a uh, different zone that may have uh, different, uh, 
density, so it changed the index, or the, the, the change, the um, uh, refractive index changes at the boundary of between, uh, the, the, of the irregularity. It, it is characterized by the fact that the refraction is covered by the full ionospheric spectrum of irregularities, at least from the large, from the large to the small one. It affects only the phase, and the physical mechanism is the phase mixing. So the, fa the phase of the satellite lights, the, receive or the received signal are mixed at ground. And then that's the problem. The problem is the diffraction, because it affects scales up to the Fresnel scale. I'm going to tell you, don't worry. It affects both amplitude and phase, and the physical mechanism is decorrelation and interference. So what is the Fresnel scale? The Fresnel scale is an elliptical zone in the free space which radio waves travel directly from transmission to reception without significant alteration. So you can determine, if you assume that your ionosphere is a thin <laughs> layer, an irregular layer, but located in a thin, on a, a, a thin, uh, a, a thin layer, you may reconstruct with some calculation this Fresnel scale, which is actually the square root of the frequency of the wavelength of your probing signal and the distance from the phase, from the screen, so from the irregularity layer. And if you consider the fact that the wavelength of GPS satellite is about 20 centimeter and that you can assume in the vertical, in the hover propagation, 315 kilometer, the order of magnitude is about a few hundred of meters. If diffraction occur, if the irregularities as a typical scale size, which is below this Fresnel scale, okay? So in terms of numbers, uh, remember I said this magical sem magic sentence, few hundred of meters, so if you consider that there is a varying geometry of observation because you track your satellite from the, from the rising from the, to the, to the, from the, uh, from the, it's rising on the field of view until the, it disappears, the scale, for instance, may range between 100 and something to 600 and something. And of course, it is not something that affects just GPS, but all, scintillation affects other frequency, and it scales with the frequency according to this, this formula, and you have, may have from a few hundred of meters up to a um, few tens of kilometers for, for HF. How to measure scintillation? So, your aesthetic irregularities causes fluctuations due to refraction and diffraction of your, on your signal. You need a way to measure. To measure scintillation, we use dedicated receivers. Uh, this is the receipt for, uh, for uh, a scintillation monitor receiver. High sampling frequency, I'm going to show you why. Low noise oscillator, because you want to have very accurate measurements of the phase. Uh, a stable clock for the same reason. A firmware able to provide the scintillation indices that I'm going to introduce uh, in, in real time. And uh, uh, these are the various generations that I use, at, at least in my institute, have been used since 2003 to characterize this you know, the, um, scintillation. To monitor scintillation, we use these two indices, those two indices, the amplitude scintillation index and the phase scintillation index. They are statistical index, usually retrieved every one minute, and they, are, they monitor the standard deviation of the intensity and phase of the signal. Usually, one minute is selected because it's a reasonable time to see meaningful changes in the, figs, in the signals due to scintillation. So, you need 50 years to have statistical, statistically meaningful indices. For instance, in one minute you have 3,000 samples um, uh, if you sample your signal at 20, uh, every 20 milliseconds, 50 years. And typically what you have is a raw amplitude and you derive these indices. Increases in the signals, uh, in, the, in the index means that there is a scintillation going on. So the simplified picture is that you are monitoring your signal, your raw amplitude, for instance, you provide the indices, the signal is going to pass through an irregularity, so the, si the signal, the amplitude start to, to fluctuate. The worst, is th the worst case is this, where you have a mixing of scattering, the, the diffraction going on, and then the satellites are just, are more than one, and in 
yeah, the net effect could be the reduced accuracy of positioning and the loss of lock in, in the worst cases. So you, it seems to your receiver that the receiver, that the satellite is not there anymore. This is a typical time profile of scintillation indices. This is again one of the receiver we have in Concordia. This is a model at Aurora Oval just to show the location of this receiver, which is well into the polar cap. Uh, this is the September 2017 storm. This is the amplitude scintillation index S4. This is the phase scintillation index uh, sigma phi. And you may see that there are similarities and differences. So those indices react to the formation of irregularities in a different way. Usually, if you don't treat your phase scintillation index in the way I'm going to show you, you will have more scintillation, more enhancement of the phase sigma phi uh, with respect to S4 at high latitude. But some, is, uh, some activity well corresponds. So in, few in a few words, you have two indices. One measure the variation in the amplitude, which is affected just by diffraction, and one measure the effect on the face, which is affected by both diffraction and refraction. So if you study the two indices together, you may learn about the various phenomena that are concurring in, in, uh, in your picture. We monitor routinely these, these indices to receivers. If you browse the Science Center, you will find, for instance, scintillation indices and total electron content among the data collections and you will be right directed to the uh, electronic space weather after atmosphere, which is the data portal maintained by INVD, by my institution, which, are, my institution, which has a section dedicated to scintillation, and where you can find data from all those receivers located all around the world. You may spot that the distribution of these receivers is not, uh, is not random, but I will show you again more. And you can derive a lot of information, but for sure you can derive things like that. So the time profile of the scintillation indices, this is particular, a plasma bubble occurring in the field of view of San Miguel de Tucumán in northern Argentina. So close to the southern crest of the equatorial anomaly. But why they are, scintillation is a, is a concern, uh, because uh, impact significantly the tracking. The tracking means the capability of keep the track with a specific satellite. On the left, you, will s you can see, for instance, it's, um, uh, the value, the dependence on the probability of loss of lock, of losing the lock with a satellite at, with respect to S4 and sigma phi for high latitude and low latitude receivers. You will see that you have the, the probability increases as those indices uh, grow up, and this is also another example, this is for low latitudes separated by the three different constellations, this is the scintillation probability on top and the corresponding probability of cycle slips that are another um, uh, effect that cause um, uh, losses of the lock with the satellite in simple words. So tracking is one issue so keeping the track with the satellite. Of course, the other issue is the performance of positioning. So GNSS satellites are, are meant to, be, to provide the precise positioning and they behave badly under scintillation events. This is, for instance, a uh, work published by some Norwegian colleagues. This is uh, phase scintillation index, sigma phi. This is rho t, which is relative to the rot. And this is the corresponding degradation of the error with some geodetic technique to provide precise position. So you see that the, as the phase scintillation index um, increases, also the error increases. And this is also the case, this is high latitude, this is low latitude. This is positioning error in the east, north, and up direction. Uh, this is Hong Kong, a receiver in Hong Kong. When you don't have scintillation, this is the performance of your, of your position. When you have scintillation, uh, things start to, to get worse. So, that's fluctuations is the problem. Uh, the real scintillation is just the one due to diffraction because somehow the refraction induces a deterministic effect on your signal. And you can, for instance, mitigate 
by using the ionosphere Fillinian combination that I mentioned earlier. Of course, it creates, in any case, troubles to the positioning because it creates cycle slips, flushes of lock, noise based noise, a second order ionospheric effect that are below, the, that are the fraction of the centimeter levels. The problem of the, dif of the diffraction is that it's stochastic in nature. And there are, the, its mitigation is very, very, very challenging. Actually, there is no solution for scintillation. Okay, this is the most tricky part of, the, of my talk. So, this is the power spectral density of the amplitude signal, which is somehow you may think at the integral of the power spectral density of the raw amplitude you measure with your GNSS as the S4. So S4 is proportional, the indices are proportional to the integral of, of this index. And diffraction as a, as a function of frequency, which is also the, the, the wave number. So you might think that the diffraction in this way, there is a breakdown of the spectrum. This is exactly the fact that your Fresnel filtering mechanism is, is, going, is going on. So above, below the Fresnel scale, above the Fresnel scale, so below the Fresnel frequency, you don't have net effect contributing to your S4. You can identify this breakdown as exactly the Fresnel frequency. And from this, you can derive also the velocity of the um, ionosphere, the irregularities affecting your, your signal. If you consider refraction, refraction is covered all the, all the, the full spectrum. Again, the sigma phi is the integral of the, of the power spectral density. You remember that sigma phi needs to be the trend because the phase of the signal is affected by Doppler because the satellite moves so the Doppler ch changes as the satellite moves. So somehow you have to decide where to put your cutoff frequency to remove the Doppler effect on your signal. This is an issue at high latitude because if you are very far in deciding if you are not good at deciding your cutoff frequency, for instance, going too far from the Fresnel frequency, you are putting order of magnitude of values into your, into your sigma phi, which are not actually the real problem. So this opened in the re is a recent year a long debate about what is scintillation. Not every fluctuation is scintillation. For instance, this I will ask you, this is a, the detrended phase of of L on L1, so the first frequency of GPS, is this scintillation? What's your answer? I define scintillation as a fluctuation. Is it a fluctuation? Yes. Is it a scintillation? You don't know. But if you check the, 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 the same thing on the second frequency, it happens the same. If, what if I... Uh, take into account the ionosphere free linear combination, it completely vanishes. This is not scintillation. This is phase fluctuation, which has an impact on tracking, which has an imp impact on the fact that on your capability or your receiver, but it's not scintillation. This is deterministic. You can cancel with the ionosphere free linear combination. Is this scintillation? You don't know. You need again to do the ionosphere free linear combination. And there are, there are residual fluctuations here. This is scintillation. So somehow you must detrend, decide your cutoff frequency to properly identify the, the, the Fresnel frequency into your phase measurement. And this is an, a paper, we, a couple of papers we published on that about this. If you consider if you proper the trend, if you proper treat your phase measurement with an adaptive cutoff frequency, you exactly get the amount of scintillation that S4 is able to provide. So the amount of scintillation and amplitude and phase is the same. The rest is fluctuation due to larger scales. 
the, the reason for that is related to the velocity of the irregularities. That magic number, 0.1 Hertz cutoff, which is the standard one, derived from low latitudes. The plasma at low latitude moves at 100 meters per second. At high latitude, you can measure it thanks to the re retrieval of the Fresnel frequency. It's way larger. And this makes the, the use of that standard approach very, very rough. Okay, so it's always like this. You will get sigma, if you want to study scintillation, you will get sigma phi calculated with this cutoff frequency. So please, if you want to do it, be wise in using it. Another proxy for scintillation is the ROTI. ROTI is the standard deviation of rot on a given time window. This is a, this has, has an historical reason. So typically rot is evaluated every five minutes. Why every five minutes? Because it derives from geodetic receiver. So it was born when there was the need to exploit geodetic receiver for ionospheric monitoring purposes. Geodetic receiver were born for other purposes, so they don't need high sampling frequency. So they provide measurement every 30 seconds. 20 hertz, 30 seconds. So if you want to have a statistical index, in five minutes, you have 10 values, okay? So somehow the, the, the ROT is able to provide valuable information about flight fluctuation because the genetic receivers are really spread all over the world. There are thousands of these receivers that are exploited for, this, for these monitoring purposes, but the, the scale they are able to sample depends on the Nyquist frequency of the rod sampling. And usually they are about to sample from few to few tenths of kilometer scale. So ROTI is not scintillation. It is very useful because it measures phase fluctuation, but it cannot be easily rescaled to weak scintillation. And it, this is because you need to know the, the velocity of the irregularities, which is not an easy information to retrieve. This is probably the most famous picture about scintillation. This has been also presented yesterday by, uh, by Tobias. In particular, the left one is the signal fading due to the scintillation in this old paper by uh, Basu et al. And this is a frequency of the GNSS scintillation in a more, how to say, outreach style paper by, um, for, by Paul Kintner, who passed away some years ago. So, May you recognize why we located the, in the instrument in those specific places? Because we would like to be very close to where the scintillation, the bulk of the scintillation occurred. Okay, I'm going towards the end of the story. So I introduced the problem, I conceptualized the problem. Let's go to have some results, mostly from the climatological point of view, because the climatology uh, you can reveal a lot of features of those, of the scintillation. This is, for instance, is the depend, we are going at low latitudes, so plasma bubble, 99.9% .9 of scintillation there is due to the small scale irregularities forming during the Rayleigh-Taylor instability processes after the pond sunset hours. And this is the dependence of scintillation measured by a network of scintillation receivers covering the South American sector uh, for, uh, for, for one solar cycle. And you see that the formation of plasma bubble or the irregularities or the small scale irregularities embedded into the plasma bubble has a strong dependence on the solar cycle. So the more we are in the in the maximum of the solar cycle, the more frequent is the formation of plasma bubble. Not only, it is also able to depict the double peaked structure of the, of the sun spot number of the solar, solar cycles. Just to prove again the, uh, the fact that they are really um, post sunset plasma bubble, there is this statistical work actually we didn't publish in a formal way this but in use for, for, for educational purposes. This is a network of receivers located in Brazil. We concentrate on the data in this box, which is actually, you may recognize here the, the magnetic equator. This is the minus 15, minus 20 band around the equator. So this, this is nicely into the southern crest of the equatorial anomaly. 
two years of data. This is local time as a function of month. These are the, the, so the solar terminators, in particular the, 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 terminate, the, the, the sunset. And this is the occurrence of the S4 amplitude scintillation above 0 0.25, which is the threshold to define moderate to strong scintillation activity. So irregularities form because of plasma bubble, nicely after the sunset. They tend to maximize between uh, October and April, no scintillation even under maximum solar flux, maximum solar flux condition. This is solar maximum. And they can also live until the end, at the beginning of the next day. So they can also be post midnight. Usually pre midnight are plasma bubble forming in your field of view. Plasma bubble in the post midnight sector are plasma drift, are a bubble drifting in your field of view. Hmm? So when, now, where? This is exactly the same data set. Uh, you may, this is the occurrence in geographic coordinate. This is the uh, minus 15 um, um, isomagnetic contour. Again, this is due to the fact that plasma bubble form, grow, decay, and the small scale tend to be created when the plasma bubble is, the life of the plasma bubble is quite advanced and they tend to decay, and the bulk of the scintillation is located along this band here. And this is the case of the another network in Southeast Asia, again, geomagnetic equator, minus 15, plus 15, iso isoclinic lines, again, this is plasma bubble. Yeah, I'm going to... This is the same network, uh, uh, it's March 2015, March 2015 was the characterized by the St. Patrick Day storm. And this is, it is, I have a question for you. This is the local time versus latitude. Again, you can recognize signatures of the, of the northern and southern crest of the equatorial anomaly. I have a question for you. I divided, we divided the period in two, in two pieces. The first part was quiet. The second part was badly disturbed. Which one is the quiet and which one is the disturbed? Okay. Eh? The question is, this is the occurrence of scintillation <coughs> for quite time and disturbed time in the same month. But I don't tell you which one, of the, which one is the quiet and which one of the, is the disturbed times. Manuel, don't, please don't suggest. <laughs> Usually, uh, worse geomagnetic conditions, worse scintillation con conditions. No, at all. This is quiet days, this is disturbed days, because there you know there is this interplay between PPF and EDF, on the average, there is an inhibition of scintillation. I go fast through the high latitudes. I'm going to show some results we published some years ago about the climatology over more than one solar cycle of data in Svalbard Island. We were very lucky because we, because we installed there in late September 2003 a scintillation receiver, thanks to Giorgiana De Franceschi, who is my boss, was very wise because the, the Halloween storm arrived, the November 2003 storm arrived, and we are probably the only one in the world having scintillation data from, for that storms. So this is, uh, we, we, at Highlight, we have to change a little bit the way of thinking. I think, so we start, we must think in terms of magnetic local time and magnetic latitude. This is a map of 11, of 11 years of data, 12 magnetic local time, oh, ah, okay. Let's do like this. 12 magnetic local time, zero magnetic local time, um, afternoon and morning sector. So in particular, this is sigma phi in the traditional way. So all the scales are there. This is S4, so just small scale. And you see here, for instance, that there is a signature at a 12 MLT and a signature in the, in the midnight sector. This is due to the fact that there, is, there are precipitating particles in the cusp and in the, in the midnight sector. 
you, the, the black and red lines are the model at auroral oval. So you will see that this is exactly the signature of the cusp, so the, the point where you have the bulk of the precipitation of particle that creates medium scale irregularities because you don't see it here in the S4. While you see signature in the midnight sector in the S4, this is the fact that you have the tongue of ionization that migrates into the polar cap and tend to fragmentate because of the Kelvin Hermony instability or gradient drift instabilities and create small scale structures. Almost finished, uh, Tobias. This is the dependence on the, qua on the geomagnetic condition. Again, sigma phi in the traditional way and as for in the traditional, uh, in the traditional way, you see that for instance, the that under minor uh, uh, moderate condition, you have the displacement of this cusp signature towards lower latitude. This means that the auroral oval moved toward lower latitude. And you have a very messy situation where the storm is severe. And of course, there are, there are no formation of small, scale, irregular of small case scale irregularities under quiet condition. They actually form. Uh, the, 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 the large scale, the medium scale form during quiet times and they tend to, however, to concentrate in the midnight sector because again to the, to the, to the instabilities. Last slide. What about mid latitudes? Are we safe from irregularities? Generally, yes, but there could be some spillover of irregularity from both high and low latitudes. This is particular, this is the case of the, um, uh, this is the case of the uh, St. Patrick Day storm. I already showed this yesterday, we were th that the plasma bubble also formed because of the response to the, to the, to the storm. They formed also in the Southern European sector and we are uh, almost submitting a paper characterizing, this is Italy, this is North of Africa, characterizing the signature of plasma bubble in the northern African, southern Mediterranean sector that affect critical, critical operation based on GNSS in the Mediterranean. Okay, sorry for the long talk. These are the take home messages. So uh, be wise in treating the, uh, the phase measurements. Uh, they might, and uh, the um, high latitudes are characterized by the formation of irregularities because of the forcing from the geospace. Low latitudes are characterized by the plasma bubble in a dramatic way. And mid latitude must be carefully taken into account for what concerns the spillover of the irregularities. Thank you. <laughs>